Hello, my name is Luis Serrano and in this video you're gonna learn about the math behind attention mechanisms in large language models. Attention mechanisms are really important in large language models. As a matter of fact, they're one of the key steps that made transformers work really well. Now in a previous video, I showed you how attention works in very high level with words flying towards each other and gravitating towards other words in order for the model to understand context. In this video, we're going to do an example in much more detail with all the math involved. Now, as I mentioned before, the concept of a transformer and the attention mechanism were introduced in this groundbreaking paper called Attention is All You Need. Now, this is a series of three videos. In the first video, I showed you what attention mechanisms are in high level. In this video, I'm going to do it with math. And in the third video that is upcoming, I will put them all together and show you how a transformer model works. So in this video in particular, you're going to learn about some concepts. Similarity between words and pieces of text is one of the concepts. One way to do this is with dot product and another one with cosine similarity. So we'll learn both. And next, you're going to learn what the key query and value matrices are as linear transformations and how they have an involvement in the attention mechanism. So let's do a quick review of the first video. First, we had embeddings. And embeddings are a way to put words or longer pieces of text. In this case, it's the plane, but in reality, you would put it in a high dimensional space in such a way that words that are similar get sent to points that are close. So for example, these are fruits. There's a strawberry, an orange, a banana, and a cherry. And they're all in the top corner of the image because they're similar words, so they get sent to similar points. And then over here, we have a bunch of brands. We have Microsoft, we have Android, then we also have a laptop and a phone. So it's the technology corner. And then the question we had in the previous video is where would you put the word Apple? And that's complicated because it's both a technology brand and also a fruit. So we wouldn't know. In particular, let's take a look at this. And the orange is on the top right and the phone is in the bottom left. Where would you put an apple? Well, then you need to look at context. So if you have a sentence like, please buy an apple and an orange, then you know you're talking about the fruit. If you have a sentence like, Apple unveiled a new phone, then you know you're talking about the technology brand. So therefore, this word needs to be given context. And the way it's given context is by the neighboring words. In particular, the word orange is the one that helps us here. So what we do is that we look at where orange is and then move the apple in that direction. And then we're going to use those new coordinates instead of the old ones for the apple. So then now the apple is closer to the fruits. So it knows more about its context given the other words, the word orange in the sentence. Now for the second sentence, the word that gives us the clue that we're talking about a technology brand is the word phone. Therefore, what we do is we move towards the word phone and then we use those coordinates in the embedding. So that apple in the second sentence knows that is more of a technology word because it's closer to a word phone. Now, another thing we saw in the previous video is that not just the word orange is going to pull the apple, but all of the other words are going to pull the apple. And how does this happen? Well, this happens with gravity or actually something very similar to gravity. Words that are close, like apple and orange, have a strong gravitational pull, so they move towards each other. On the other hand, the other words don't have a strong gravitational pull because they're far away. Actually, they're not far away, but they're dissimilar. So we can think of distance as a metric, but in a minute, I will tell you exactly what I'm talking about here. But we can think of the words as being far away. And as I said, words that are close get pulled together and words that are far away get pulled, but not very much. And so after one gravitational step, then the word apple and orange are much closer. And the other words in the sentence, well, they may move closer, but not that much. And what happens is that context pulls. So if I've been talking about fruits for a while and I said banana, strawberry, lemon, blueberry, and orange, and then I say the word apple, then you would imagine that I'm talking about a fruit. And what happens here in space is that we have a galaxy of fruit words somewhere and they have a strong pull. So when the word apple comes in, it gets pulled by this galaxy. And therefore, now the apple knows that it's a fruit and not a technology brand. Now, remember that I told you that words are far away, but that's not really true. In reality, what we need to look is at the concept of similarity. So what is similarity? Well, as humans, we have an idea of words being similar to each other's or dissimilar. And that's exactly what similarity measures. 
So before we saw, for example, that the words cherry and orange are similar and they're different than the word phone. And we kind of have the impression that there's a measure of distance, like cherry and orange are close, so they have a small distance in between, and cherry and phone are far, so they have a large distance. But as I mentioned, what we want is the opposite, a measure of similarity which is high when the words are similar and low when the words are different. So next I'm going to show you three ways to measure similarity that are actually very similar at the end. The first one is called dot product. So imagine that you have these three words over here, cherry, orange, and phone. And as we saw before, the axis in the embedding actually means something. It could be something tangible for humans or maybe something that the computer just knows and we don't. But let's say that the axis here measure tech for the horizontal axis and fruitness for the vertical axis. So the cherry and the, and the orange have high fruitness and low tech. That's why they're located in the top left. And the phone has high tech and low fruitness. That's why it's located in the bottom right. Now, we need a measure that is high for these two numbers, cherry and orange. So the measure of similarity is going to be the following. We look at their coordinates, 1, 4 for cherry and 0, 3 for orange. And remember that one of them is the amount of tech and the other one is the amount of fruitness. Now, if these words are similar, we would imagine that they have similar amounts of tech and similar amounts of fruitness. In particular, they have both have low tech. So therefore, if we multiply these two numbers, it should be a low number. That's 1 times 0. But they both have high fruitness. So if we multiply those two numbers, 4 times 3, we get a high number. And when we add them together, that's the product of the tech and the product of the fruitness, we get a high number, which is 12. Now, let's do the same thing for cherry and phone. So the similarity should be a small number. Let's see, between 1, 4, and 3, 0, what is the dot product? Well, it's 1 times 3, the product of the tech values, plus 4 times 0, the product of the fruitness values. And that's 1 times 3 plus 4 times 0, which is a small number, which is 3. Notice that the reason is because if uh, one of the words has low tech, the other one has high tech, and if one of them has low fruitness, the other one has high fruitness, so we're not going to get very high by multiplying them and adding. And the extreme case is orange phone. This orange phone, the coordinates are 0, 3, and 3, 0. So when we multiply 0 times 3, we get 0. Plus 3 times 0 equals 0. And so we get 0. Notice that these two words are actually perpendicular with respect to the origin. And when two words are perpendicular, they're always going to have dot product equals 0. So dot product is our first measure of similarity. It's high when the words are similar or close in the embedding, and low when the words are are far away and notice that it could be negative as well. The second measure of similarity is called cosine similarity and it looks very different from dot product but they're actually very similar. What we do here is we use an angle. So let's calculate the cosine similarity between orange and cherry. We look at the angle that the two vectors made when they are traced from the origin. This angle is 14. If you want to know how to calculate it, it's actually the arctangent of one quarter. And here it is. So that number is 0.97. That means that the similarity between cherry and orange, the cosine similarity, is 0 0.97. Now let's calculate the one between cherry and phone. That angle is 76 because it's the arc 10 of 4 divided by 1, and that number is 0 0.24. So the similarity between cherry and orange is 0 0.24, which is much lower than 0 0.97. And finally, guess what the third one is going to be? The similarity between orange and phone is going to be the cosine of this angle, which is 90, and that is again 0. So this is a similarity of 0. Cosine similarity, since it's a cosine, it is between 1 and minus 1. So 1 is for words that are very similar, and then 0 and negative numbers are for words that are very different. Now, I told you that dot product and cosine similarity are very similar, but they don't look that similar. Why are they so similar? Well, because they're the same thing if the vectors have length 1. More specifically, if I were to draw a unit circle around the origin, and I take every point and I draw a line from the center to the point and put the word where the line meets the circle, that means I scale everything down so that all the vectors have length 1, then cosine similarity and the dot product are the exact same thing. So basically, if all my vectors have norm 1, then cosine similarity and dot product are the same thing. So at the end of the day, what we are saying is that dot product and cosine similarity are the same up 
to a scalar. And the scalar is the product of the two lengths of the vector. So if I take the dot product and divide it by the product of the lengths of the vectors, then I get the cosine similarity. Now there is a third one called scale dot product, which as you can imagine, it's another multiple of the dot product. And that's actually the one that gets used in attention. So let me show you quickly what it is. It is the dot product just like before. So here we get 12, except that now we divide it by the square root of the length of the vector. And the length of the vector is two because these vectors have two coordinates. And so we get 8.49 for the first one. For the second one, we had a three divided by root two is 2.12. And for the third one, well, we had a zero and that divided by root two is also zero. Now the question is, why are we dividing by this square root of two? Well, that is because when you have very long vectors, for example, with a thousand coordinates, you get really, really large dot products and you don't want that. You want to manage these numbers. You want these numbers to be small. So that way you divide by the square root of the length of the vectors. Now, as I mentioned before, the one we use for attention is the scale dot product. But for this example, just to have nice numbers, we're gonna do it with cosine similarity. But at the end of the day, remember that everything gets scaled by the same number. So let's look at an example. We have the sentences, an apple and an orange and an apple phone. And let's calculate some similarity. So first, let's look at some coordinates. Let's say that orange is in position zero three phone is in position 4, 0, and this ambiguous apple is in position 2, 2. Now, embeddings don't only have two dimensions, they have many, many, many. So to make it more realistic, let's say we have three dimensions. So there's an other dimension here, but all the words we have are at zero over that dimension. So they're in that flat plane by the wall. However, the sentences have more words, the words and and and. So let's say that and 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 are over here at coordinate 0, 0, 2 and 0, 0, 3. Now let's calculate all the similarities between all these words. That's going to be this table here. The first easy step to notice is that the cosine similarity between every word and itself is one. Why? Well, because every angle between every word and itself is zero and the cosine of zero is one. So all of them are one. Now let's calculate the similarity between orange and phone. We already saw that this is zero because the angle is 90. Now let's do between orange and apple. Angle is 45. Same thing between apple and phone. And the cosine of 45 degrees is 0 0.71. Finally, let's look at phone and and, or actually any word between orange, apple and phone makes an angle of 90 degrees with and and and. So all these numbers are actually zero. And finally, between and and and, the angle is zero. So therefore, the cosine is one. So this is our entire table of similarities between the words. And we're going to use this table of similarity to move the words around. And that's the attention step. So let's look at this table, but only for the words in the sentence, an apple and an orange. We have the words orange, apple, and an an, and we're going to move them around. So we're going to take them and change their coordinates slightly. Each of these words would be sent to a combination of itself and all the other words. And the combination is given by the rows of this table. So more specifically, let's look at orange. Orange would go to one times orange, which is this coordinate over here, plus 0 0.71 times apple, which is this coordinate over here, plus zero times and plus zero times and, which means nothing else. Now let's look at where apple goes. Apple goes to 0 0.71 times orange plus one times apple plus zero times and plus zero times n. Now let's look at and and n. They go to zero times orange plus zero times apple plus one times and plus one times n. And the same thing happens with the word n. It goes to zero times orange plus zero times apple plus one times and plus one times n. So basically what we did is we took each of the words and sent it to a combination of the other words. So now orange has a little bit of apple in it and apple has a little bit of orange in it, etc., etc. So we're just moving words around and later I'm gonna show you graphically what this means. Now let's also do it for the other sentence, an apple phone. This one I'm gonna do it a little faster. Phone goes to one times phone plus 0 0.71 times apple plus zero times n. Apple goes to 0 0.71 times phone plus 1 times apple plus 0 times n, and n goes to 1 times n, so itself. However, 
there are some technicalities I need to tell you. First of all, let's look at the word orange. It goes to 1 times orange plus 0 0.71 times apple. But these are big numbers. Imagine doing this many times. I end up being sent to 500 times orange plus 400 times apple. I don't want to have these big numbers. I want to be scaling everything down. So in particular, I want these coefficients to always add to 1. So that no matter how many transformations I make, I'm going to end up with some percentage of orange, some percentage of apple, and maybe percentages of other words, but I don't want these to blow up. So in order for the coefficients to add to 1, I would divide by their sum, 1 plus 0.71. So I get 0 0.58 orange plus 0 0.42 times apple. So that process is called normalization. However, there's a small problem. Can you see it? Well, what happens is this. Let's say that I have orange goes to 1 times orange minus 1 times motorcycle. Because remember that cosine distance can be a negative number. So if I want these coefficients to add to 1, I would divide by their sum, which is 1 minus 1. And dividing by 0 is a terrible thing to do. Never, ever, ever divide by 0. So how do I solve this problem? Well, I would like these coefficients to always be positive. Find a way to take these coefficients and turn them into something positive. I'm good. However, I still want to respect their order. 1 is a lot bigger than minus 1, so I want the coefficient that 1 becomes to be still a lot bigger than the coefficient that minus 1 becomes. So what is the solution? Well, a common solution here is instead of taking a coefficient x, take the coefficient e to the x. So raise e to the all the numbers you see here. And what do we get? Well, if I take every number and turn it into e to the that number, then I have e to the 1 times orange plus e to the 0 0.71 times apple divided by e to the 1 plus 0 0.71. The numbers change slightly. Now they're 0 0.57 and 0 0.43. But what happens in the bottom one? Well, 1 becomes e to the 1, negative 1 becomes e to the minus 1, and now I add them, and the bottom becomes e to the 1 plus e to the minus 1, and that becomes 0 0.88 orange plus 0 0.12 motorcycle. So we effectively turn the numbers into positive ones respecting their order. So we do this step for the coefficients to always add to 1. This step is called softmax and it's a very very popular function in machine learning. So now when we go to the tables and how those tables created these new words then we can change the numbers to the softmax numbers and get these actual new numbers. So this is what's going to tell us how the words are going to move around. But actually, before I show you this geometrically, I have to admit that I've been lying to you. Because softmax doesn't turn a 0 into a 0. In fact, these four numbers get sent to e to the 1, e to the 0 0.71, e to the 0, and e to the 0. And e to the 0 is 1. So this combination of words, when you normalize it, it actually becomes... 0.4 orange plus 0.3 apple plus 0.15 and plus 0.15 and. So those and 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 are not that hard to get rid of, but as you may imagine in real life, they will have such small coefficients that they're pretty much negligible. But at the end of the day, you have to consider all the numbers when you do softmax. But let's go back to pretending that and 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 are not important. In other words, Let's go back to the original equations. Apple goes to 0.43 orange plus 0.57 of apple. And apple goes to 0.43 phone plus 0.57 of apple. So if we forget about the words and and and, let's actually go back to the plane here where the three words are nicely fit in the plane. So let's look at the equations again. Apple going to 43% of orange plus 57% of apple really means that we're taking 43% of the apple and turning it into orange. Geometrically, this means that we're taking the line from apple to orange and moving the word apple 43% along the way. That gives us the new coordinates 1.14 and 2.43. For the second sentence, we do the same thing. We take 43% away from the apple and turn it into the word phone. That means we trace this line from apple to phone and locate the new apple 43% along the way. That means it's in the coordinates 2.86 and 1.14. So what does this mean? That means that when we're going to talk about the first sentence, 
we're not going to use the coordinates 2, 2 for Apple. We're going to use the coordinates 1.14 and 2.43. And we're in the second sentence. We're not going to use the coordinates 2, 2. We're going to use the coordinates 2.86 and 1.14. So now we have better coordinates because these new coordinates are closer to the coordinates of either orange or phone, depending on which sentence the word Apple appears. And therefore, we have a better version of the word Apple. Now, this is not much, but imagine doing this many times. In a transformer, the attention step is applied many times. So if you apply it many times, at the end, the words are going to end up much, much closer to what is dictating the context in that piece of text. And in a nutshell, that is what attention is doing. So now we're ready to learn the keys, queries, and values matrices. If you look at the original diagrams for scale dot product attention on the left and multi head attention on the right, they contain these K, Q, and V. Those are the key, query, and value matrices that we're going to denote by keys, queries, and values. Actually, let's first learn keys and queries, and we're going to learn values later in this video. So let me show you how I like to see keys and queries matrices. Now recall from previously in this video that when you want to do the attention step, you take the embedding and then you move this ambiguous apple towards the phone or towards the orange, depending on the context of the sentence. Now in the previous video, we learned what a linear transformation is. It's basically a matrix that you multiply all the vectors by and you can get something like this, another embedding, or maybe something like this. A good way to imagine linear transformations is send that squared to any parallelogram and then the plane follows because the square tessellates the plane. So therefore you just continue tessellating the plane, you press some parallelograms and you get a transformation from the plane to the plane. So these two examples over here are linear transformations of the original embedding. Now, let me ask you a question. Out of these three, which one is the best one for applying the attention step and which one is the worst one and which one is so-so? Feel free to pause the video and think about it and I'll tell you the answer. Well, the first one is so-so because when you apply attention, it kind of separates the fruit apple from the technology apple, but not so much. The second one is awful because you apply the attention step and it doesn't really separate the two words. So this one's really bad. It doesn't really add much information. And the third one is great because it really spaces out the phone and the orange and therefore it separates the technology apple and the fruit apple very well. So this one's the best one. And the point of the keys and queries matrix is going to help us find really good embeddings where we can do attention and get a lot of good information. Now, how do they do it? Well, through linear transformations, but let me be more specific. Remember that attention was done by calculating the similarity. Now let's look at how we did it. Let's say you have the vector for orange and the vector for phone. In this example, they have three coordinates, but they could have as many as we want. And we want to find the similarity. So the similarity is the dot product. It actually was the scale dot product or the cosine distance. But at the end of the day, it's the same up to a scalar. So we're just going to take them all similarly. And the dot product can be seen as the product of the first one times the transpose of the second one. This is a matrix product. And as I said before, if we don't care so much about the scaling, we can think of it as the cosine distance in that particular embedding. Now, how do we get a new embedding? Well, this is where the keys and queries matrices come in. When we look at the keys and queries matrices, what they do is they modify the embeddings. So instead of taking the vector for orange, we take the vector for orange times the keys matrix. And instead of taking the vector for phone, we take the vector for phone times the queries matrix. And we get new embeddings. And when we want to calculate the similarity, then it's the same thing. It's the product of the first one times the transpose of the second one, which is the same as the transpose of queries times the transpose of phone. And this over here is a matrix that defines a linear transformation. And that's the linear transformation that takes this embedding into this one over here. So the keys and queries matrix work together to create a linear transformation that will improve our embedding to be able to do attention better. And therefore, what we're doing is that we're modifying the similarity in one embedding and taking the similarity on a different embedding. And we're going to make sure that this is a better one. Actually, we're going to calculate lots of them and find the best ones, but that's coming a little later. But imagine keys and queries matrices as a way 
to transform our embedding into one that is better suited for this attention problem. And now that you've learned what the keys and queries matrices are, let me show you what the values matrix is. Recall that the keys and queries matrices actually turn the embedding into one that is best for calculating similarities. However, here's the thing. That embedding on the left is not where you want to move the words. You only want it for calculating similarities. Let's say that there's an ideal embedding for moving the words, and it's the one over here. So what do we do? Well, using the similarities we found on the left embedding, we're going to move the words on the right embedding. And why is that the case? Well, what happens is that the embedding on the left is actually optimized for finding similarities, whereas the embedding on the right is optimized for finding the next word in a sentence. Why is this? Because a transformer, what it does, and we're going to learn this in the next video, but a transformer finds the next word in a sentence and it continues finding the next word until it builds long pieces of text. So the embedding when you want to move the words around is one that's optimized for finding the next word. And recall that the embedding on the left is found by the keys and queries matrices and the embedding on the right is found by the values matrices. And what does the values matrix do? Well, it's the one that takes the embedding on the left and multiplies every vector to get the embedding on the right. So when you take the embedding on the left, multiply it by the matrix V, you get another transformation because you can concatenate these linear transformations and you get the linear transformation that corresponds to the embedding on the right. Now, why is it that the embedding on the left is the best one for finding similarities? Well, this one is one that knows the features of the words. For example, it would be able to pick up the color of a fruit, the size, the amount of fruitness, the flavor, the technology that is in, in the phone, etc., etc., is the one that captures features on the words. Whereas the embedding for finding the next word is one that knows when two words could appear in the same context. So, for example, if the sentence is, I want to buy a blank, the next word could be car, could be apple, could be phone. In the embedding on the right, all those words are close by because the embedding on the right is good for finding the next word in a sentence. So recall that the keys and queries matrices can capture the high level and the low level granular features of the words. The embedding on the right doesn't have that. It's optimized for the next word in a sentence. And that's how the key, query, and values matrices actually give you the best embeddings to apply attention in. Now, just to show you a little bit of the math that happens in the value matrix, Imagine that these are your similarities that you found after the softmax function. Then that means apple goes to 0.3 orange plus 0.4 apple plus 0.15 and plus 0.15 and that's given the second row of the table. And when you multiply this matrix by the value matrix, then you get some other embedding like that. Now, everything here is of length four. It could be length completely different because the value matrix doesn't need to be a square. It can be a rectangle. And then the second row tells us that instead, apple should go to V2 one times orange plus V2 two times apple plus V2 three times and plus V2 four times and. So that's how the value matrix comes in and transform the first embedding into another one. Well, that was a lot of stuff, so let's do a little summary. On the left, you have the diagram for scale dot product tension and the formula. So let's break it down step by step. First, you have this step over here where you multiply K and Q transpose. What is that? Well, that is the dot product. And you're dividing by the square root of DK. DK is the length of each of the vectors. Remember that this is called scale dot product. So what we're doing here is finding the similarities between the words. I'm going to denote the similarities by angles with cosine distance, but you know that I'm talking about scale dot product instead. So now that we found the similarities, we move to the step over here with the softmax, which is the one where we figure out where to move the words. In particular, the technology Apple moves towards the phone and the fruit Apple moves towards the orange. But we're not going to make the movements on this embedding because this embedding is not optimal for that. This embedding is optimal for finding similarities. So we're going to use the values matrix to turn this embedding into a better one. V is acting as a linear transformation that transforms the left embedding into the embedding on the right. 
and in the embedding on the right is where we move the words because this embedding over here is optimized for the function of the transformer which is finding the next word in a sentence. So that is self-attention. Now what's multi-head attention? Well it's very similar except you use many heads and by many heads I mean many key and query and value matrices. Here we're going to show three but you could use eight, you could use 12, you could use many more and the more you use the better. Obviously the more you use the more computing power you need but the more you use the more likely you'll be finding some pretty good ones. So this 3k and q matrices as we saw before they form three embeddings where you can apply attention. Now k and q are the ones that help us find the embeddings where you find the similarities between the words. Now we also have a bunch of value matrices as many as key and query matrices always the same number and just like before these value matrices transform these embeddings where we find similarities into embeddings where we can move the words around. Now here is the magic step. How do we know which ones are good and which ones are bad? Well right now we don't. We concatenate them first. What does concatenating mean? Well if I have a table of two columns and another table of two columns and another table of two columns and I concatenate them I get a table of six columns. Geometrically that means if I have let's say an embedding of two dimensions and another one and another one I concatenate them then I get an embedding of six dimensions. Now I can't draw in six dimensions but imagine that this thing over here is a really high dimensional embedding of six dimensions. So something with six axes. In real life if you have a lot of big embeddings you end up with a very high dimensional embedding which is not optimal. So that's why we have this linear step over here. The linear step over here is a rectangular matrix that is going to transform this into a lower dimensional embedding that we can manage. But there's more. This matrix over here learns which embeddings are good and which embeddings are bad. So for example the best embedding for finding the similarities was the third one so this one gets scaled up and the worst embedding was the one in the middle so this one gets scaled down. So this matrix over here this linear step actually does a lot and now if we know what matrices are better than others and the linear step actually scales those well and scales the bad ones by a small amount then we end up with a really good embedding and so we end up doing attention in a pretty optimal embedding which is exactly what we want. Now I've done a lot of magic here because I haven't really told you how to find this key query and value matrices. I mean they seem to do great jobs but finding them is probably not easy. Well that's something we're gonna see more in the next video but the idea is that this key query and value matrices get trained with the transformer model. Here's a transformer model and you can see that multi-head attention appears several times. I like to simplify this diagram into this diagram over here where you have several steps tokenization, embedding, positional encoding, then a feed forward and an attention part that repeats several times and each of the blocks has an attention block. So in other words imagine training a humongous neural network and the neural network has inside a bunch of key query and value matrices that get trained as the neural network gets trained to guess the next word. But I'm getting into the next video. This is what we're going to learn on the third video of this series. So again this was the second one, Attention Mechanisms Math. The first one had a high level idea of attention and the third one is going to be on transformer models. So stay tuned when that is out I will put a link in the comments. So that's all folks, congratulations for getting until the end. This, this was a bit of a complicated video but I hope that the pictorial examples were helpful. Now time for some acknowledgements. I would have not been able to make this video if not for my friend and colleague Joao Araujo who is a genius and knows a lot about attention and transformers and he actually helped me go over these examples and helped me form these images. So thank you Joao. And some more acknowledgements, Jay Alamar was also tremendously helpful in me understanding transformers and attention. We had long conversations where he explained this to me several times. And my friend Omar as well, Omar Flores, was very helpful too. I actually have a podcast where I ask him questions about transformers for about an hour and I learned a lot from this podcast. It's in Spanish, 
but if you do speak Spanish, check it out. The link is in the comments and it's also in my Spanish YouTube channel, serrano.academy. And if you like this material, definitely check out llm.university. It's a course I've been doing at Cohere with my very knowledgeable colleagues, Mior Amer and Jay Alamar, the same Jay as before. This is a very comprehensive course and it's taught in a very simple language. It talks about all the stuff in this video, including embedding, similarity, transformers, attention, also, it has a lot of labs where you can do semantic search, you can do prompt engineering, many other topics. And so it's very hands-on and it also teaches you how to deploy models. Basically, it's a zero to 100 course on LLMs and I recommend you to check it llm.university. And finally, if you want to follow me, well, please subscribe to the channel and uh, hit like or put a comment. I love reading the comments. It's serrano.academy. You can also tweet at me at serrano.academy or check out my page where I have blog posts and a lot of other stuff. The page is also serrano.academy and I have a book called Rocking Machine Learning in which I explain machine learning in this way, in a simple and pictorial way with labs that are on GitHub. So check it out. There's a 40% discount code serrano.yt if you want to take a look. The link and information is on the comments. So thank you very much for your attention and see you in the next video.